Dean Jansen was one of the most uh, positive and helpful people in the uh, newspaper operation for all the years he and I were there together. And uh, so I'm especially pleased to have a chance to uh, meet up with him here and to uh, benefit from his involvement in this uh, group. And I appreciate the chance to be back here. I have been here before. Um, and this is a group of people who uh, would come out on a Sunday morning to do something that's moving, spiritual, and also focused on uh, serious issues in uh, the community and the broader world around us. So I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, I would add a thought. I, I was interested that the uh, collection was for Common Ground which is an organization I've had a fair amount of dealings with and, and respect them a lot. And I live just a few blocks from Sherman Park and from Washington High School. The notion that, I, I drive by Washington High School pretty much every day on my way to or from work. The athletic facilities and the recreational facilities, which is what the collection was about, at Sherman Park are pretty decent, but they could be a lot better. At Washington High School, they are definitely not on a par with what um, any high school up in this area, if, by the way, I try not to mince words too much, so I, I may be a little provocative. Homestead, Cedarburg High School, Grafton High School, keep going on the list these communities would never put up with what the kids at Washington High School have when it comes to athletic facilities, especially the football field and the outdoor facilities. Um, you just look at that and you say there are inequities. Things are still not fair when it comes to the educational opportunities being offered to kids in the lower income part of the spectrum. Um, I, I'll offer a few thoughts here on uh, the education scene in Wisconsin and particularly uh, in Milwaukee. And I hope we'll take a few minutes uh, if anyone wants to uh, comment or ask questions, I'd, I'd be glad to respond. Left to my own devices, I'm capable of going until supper time or so. Um, <laughs> but I'll try not to do that. Um, in some ways, I'm not that cheerful about the entire education scene in Wisconsin. And I say that with a great deal of respect and, and even uh, uh, awe for all the teachers and school leaders and people who work in schools who are doing such demanding and important work and doing it with such it, with, with very few exceptions, are doing it with such uh, commitment and integrity and care. Um, you know, people sometimes badmouth teachers. There are such things as bad teachers, but their number is very few. So as a whole, um, I have nothing but respect for the educators who work in every community and every school around us. Nonetheless, it worries me in terms of the future of the state, and in terms of the future of our kids, that we're still not really doing as well as we ought to. And that, you can say it originates in the homes, it originates in the schools, it originates whatever, it's something that all of us need to own. The truth is that test scores for example, I don't think test scores are the end all and be all, but they are a good indicator of what's going on in schools um, in many ways. Um, test scores in Wisconsin as a whole have been flat for quite a number of years, 10, 15, 20 years. The overall achievement of kids in Wisconsin, and this is in every community, even the higher income communities like the one we're in here, um, are really not 
overall that impressive. Fewer than half the kids in the state are rated as proficient or advanced in reading or math at every grade level. Um, ACT college scores, college entrance exam scores, which are now used as the accountability scores for high schools, have actually gone down in recent years, and there's some reasons for that that are not so bad, but there are also reasons to be concerned. And just in general, the whole subject of education hasn't had much momentum in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's position in terms of uh, comparisons to other states and to national averages has actually gone down some in the last 20 years. Uh, we used to be near the top of the pack, now we're more in the middle of the pack. And there are ways of measuring this that are nonpartisan and, and uh, uh, sound in terms of, of the, the tools for measuring. So I think all of us need to be concerned about education at every level, for every kid, for every community, and for the future of Wisconsin. We do, I don't, <clears throat> definitely don't intend to get political here, but we do have an interesting passage at this point. We are uh, just over two weeks away from an election in which the uh, incumbent governor is running now labeling himself the education governor, and certainly uh, schools and school issues have been one of the things he's either best known or most notorious for, depending on your politics. And he's running against the state superintendent of public instruction, who's been in that office now for nine years, was the deputy state superintendent for eight years before that, so he's a long time education figure, and education issues to be honest, in a certain way, I'm not happy with the dialogue that's going on because it's, it's not quite as issue-oriented as I wish it were. It's more slogan-oriented. Um, nonetheless, education issues are at the fore. Um, the closest I'll get to a partisan statement here, I think, and I said this in the newspaper several weeks ago, is that neither one of them can claim to have unlocked the door to great success in education because things have not improved for all the time both of them have been in office. So is that their fault? Of course not, at least not entirely. Uh, a lot of these things are so deeply rooted and have such multiple and complicated causes, but why aren't kids doing better? Neither of them can claim to have the key to solving that. So that leads me into my main theme here, which is that so many things, and, and I, I'll turn my focus mostly to um, the, the students who are at the, the lower brackets of, of the academic and income spectrums. Education achievement it correlates with zip codes, and unfortunately that's way too true as an observation. So mostly, say, the city of Milwaukee, but also kids in other parts of the city. And unfortunately, but you can't avoid the, uh, the, the facts of it, strong correlation to race and ethnicity, that minority kids, especially African Americans, are just doing way worse than white kids and higher income kids. But it goes beyond income alone. Very complicated stuff. I spent way too many years thinking about this. So many things have been tried. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, nationwide. Um, changes in education programs, reading wars and math wars, uh, changes in the laws, the, the No Child Left Behind law that was passed in uh, 2001 by Congress and signed in 2002. And people should remember, they associate that law with George W. Bush. It was actually passed almost unanimously by Congress and when President Bush signed the law in January of 2002. The person standing next to him was Teddy Kennedy. Um, so very much a bipartisan effort in its origins. Um, under President Obama, the uh, race to the top and, and other initiatives, um, changes in structures, charter schools, voucher schools, uh, uh, school desegregation. In fact, I, 
new superintendents, new ways of training teachers, new this, new that, and none of it has particularly moved the needle. So my, the, the title that I suggested for what I was going to talk about today was what can we learn about what to do positively from all the things that haven't made a difference. And I think we're at an extremely important point currently um, when it comes to that discussion. Take the case of, of Milwaukee. Uh, I sometimes would use several dates as keys to understanding what's happened in Milwaukee. One of those dates would be 1976. Judge, Federal Judge John W. Reynolds issued a uh, court order that Milwaukee schools had been intentionally segregated by race and that there needed to be corrective action, which led to a large scale uh, program of school desegregation, largely built around school busing, but also including the creation of a variety of specialty schools, what they're called magnet schools at that time, some of which remain the best schools in Milwaukee, Rufus King High School, uh, Golda Meir School for the Gifted and Talented, the Language Immersion Schools, uh, the rise of some Montessori schools. These are all really good schools that are still around 40 plus years later. However, school desegregation as a whole didn't bring what people wanted it to bring. Um, for one thing, white people fled the city in the following decade and a half in enormous numbers, not only because of the school desegregation order, but you can't ignore that that was a factor. And in 1976, Milwaukee Public Schools was roughly two-thirds white and one-third minority. Um, it is now about 12% white and 88% minority. One of the really interesting things, by the way, is that at the time of the Reynolds School desegregation order, everything had to do with white kids and black kids. Um, and there was actual quotas for enrollment in, in many of the schools in the city and busing was done to, to try to make that come to, to pass. Hispanic kids were not a factor at all. They're not in the, they weren't in the court orders, they weren't in the program. They were only one to two or three percent of the system at that time. Today, Hispanic kids are more than a quarter of the population of the city, of, of Milwaukee Public Schools. The percent of the population of the city of Milwaukee that's Hispanic has gone way up as well. Um, and in any case, the achievement that people, you know, the, the improvement, the, the equal opportunity, the equity, use whatever term you want, frankly, it didn't happen. Another date I would pick would be 1998. The uh, Milwaukee was the first place in the country to have a private school voucher uh, option for, for people. It started out in 1990, actually, uh, passed by the state legislature as a very small program for only uh, non-religious schools, and, as, and a small number of, of kids were, were allowed in. There was, there was a tight cap on the program. 1998, which I consider the real start of the voucher program, um, was when the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled in a four to two decision that it was constitutional. You're welcome to have your own opinions on whether this is uh, what you would hold yourself, but nonetheless, this is what the court ruled, that it was constitutional to use public money to support kids going to religious schools. Um, the logic was that it was parents who were making the decision and not the state, and therefore it was a parental choice and not state support of the religious schools. This triggered an enormous growth of uh, vouchers, and it came at the same time that charter schools, which are a similar but separate entity and, and cannot be religious. One of the simplest distinctions between a charter school and a voucher school is voucher schools are almost all religious 
charter schools cannot be religious. Um, nonetheless, at this point, there's been an enormous change in the landscape of education in the city of Milwaukee, more so than any other city in the country, although there's some competition for that, New Orleans, Washington, D.C., a few others um, that, that have also had, well, New Orleans had huge changes triggered by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Um, in any case, these days, only a little over half of all the students in the city of Milwaukee, but roughly 120,000 kids, who are getting publicly supported education are getting it in the Milwaukee public school system. And just under half are getting it in private religious schools, in independent charter schools, and many of them still, thousands of them, in the suburbs under the state's open enrollment law, in public schools, but nonetheless not in the city of Milwaukee or in MPS. Huge change in the landscape. I might add it's a popular change in that parents like it. Every indication is that parents like having choice. What it hasn't changed is student achievement and success and the opportunity to go on to college and to bright futures. Still really pretty grim situations. The statistics on the city of Milwaukee kids and I'm not speaking only in terms of race, when it comes to achievement, graduation, attendance, you name it, are jaw-droppingly bad. And they remain that way. In fact, have gotten worse in some categories. Uh, my favorite, so to speak, is still that only one in five kids in Milwaukee is rated as proficient or advanced in reading at all grades up to uh, high school where they're approaching graduation and you say well what about the ones who are just below that level which in the state test would be called basic that's roughly another 35 percent about 45 percent of all the kids in Milwaukee and for that matter almost 20 percent of all the kids in the state are rated as it's either called minimal or below basic they keep changing the terms which means they basically aren't ready to go on to productive adult lives. You cannot make it in today's world if you can't read. And if you're at that minimal level, you're not on a good course. It's, it, opportunity is closing for you. These kids, in huge numbers, are being given life sentences at the bottom of society, economically, if not in, in other ways. So this is very disturbing, really disturbing. Why do I say that now is a time of perhaps special opportunity? Because I think from all of these things that haven't worked, there is a lesson, and it's beginning to gain momentum, which is to say we need to address the actual lives of kids. Um, 2016, a book came out called Evicted. I bet some of you have read it. If you haven't, I highly encourage you to read it, not because it's going to be a fun read for you. Um, it was written by a guy named Matthew Desmond, who was at that time a graduate student at UW-Madison. Um, and it was basically his dissertation. And it's entirely about the lives of people, both adults and kids, in Milwaukee. The entire book is set in Milwaukee and the instability in their lives, largely built around their, their housing situations, and particularly the large number who go through evictions and move and move and move, um, which is highly destabilizing for kids. Uh, there's no indication at all that this does anything but harm to a child's education. Um, and Evicted became a national sensation. It was one of the New York Times 10 best books of the year. It was, Desmond won a Pulitzer Prize. He's gone on to uh, become a very prominent figure. Evicted was one of the reasons that um, this whole subject of stability in kids' lives picked up momentum. At the same time, there's been a growing interest in the uh, medical community and in the social service community in 
looking at the impact of trauma on children's lives. Uh, trauma meaning all sorts of things, uh, uh, social instability, uh, bad home situations. Um, there, there's a, there's a, what's become a popular test among advocates of these things that you can give to kids or adults for that matter called uh, the ACEs test. Um, and and uh, uh, it, 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 it measures in 10 questions how many traumatic forces there have been in your life, divorce, uh, domestic abuse, instability, uh, in terms of housing, have you ever been homeless? Um, uh, have you had the death of a close relative? Things, things that sometimes don't have anything to do with uh, income, and the, and sometimes the ACEs scores among kids in higher income communities are also very high, um, and a strong awareness that the higher an ACEs score, the higher the risk going into adulthood, going out 30 or 40 years from beyond their childhood of failure to succeed in school, failure to succeed in relationships, failure to succeed in the job market. Um, and, a grow, and, and the good news here is that there's a strong new interest in figuring out ways to reduce trauma in children's lives and to respond in a positive, helpful way, therapeutic way, training of teachers, training of the medical communities, training of, of, uh, in clinics, you know, both social service clinics and, and medical clinics serving the, the central city and elsewhere, um, and saying how, how can we help stabilize the lives of kids, help minimize the, the damage being done to them by the circumstances of their lives, including oftentimes the circumstances in their homes, um, I think it's a huge question and a greatly important one whether this can have some impact. There was this uh, kind of a summit meeting on this in late September. Uh, start, there, there was an event at the, uh, at the new basketball arena, the Pfizer Forum. I was there. Um, with about 1,500 people, basically everybody involved in this issue in town, um, followed by two days of sessions at the, at the convention center in downtown Milwaukee um, to try to get some momentum behind this. It's got other dimensions too. I think there's an increasing interest in schools, especially in uh, schools with, uh, there are such things, even, even in all the circumstances kids have, and even in the central city of Milwaukee, there's still some schools that are decidedly better, better run, better focused, um, and have better accomplishment than others. A lot of those schools are, are moving more towards promoting um, character education programs, trying to develop traits in kids. There, there's a separate from the ACEs test. ACEs, by the way, stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, and, uh, but separate from that, there's been uh, increased interest in building up in kids and, and advocacy that these traits can be built up. Traits such as grit, this is a popular word in education these days, grit, resilience, optimism, um, things like, you know, optimism is an interesting one. If you have a, this is, this is a research-backed finding, if you have a positive sense that you're going somewhere in life, that there's a future for you, even talking about kids who are five or seven or nine years old, the chance of you moving forward are much higher. So optimism is one of the things they try to measure. And that you can instill this in kids with the proper encouragement, much of which you're not going to be surprised to hear that has to do with relationships, relationships with, with uh, helpful, supportive adults who may often be a teacher and not just a parent could be someone out in, a, in a, the neighborhood, but positive relationships have very positive benefits. So we're at a point where the shift is really important, I think, between trying to say, well, if we just gave them better reading textbooks, our future would be much better, to saying, what if we got more kids on track to do 
well in school and well in their future and on track by developing these shall we say soft skills, their character traits, their sense of having a future and giving them support in dealing with the really difficult issues that they face in their lives. So my hope, I regard myself as an inexplicably optimistic person, um, inexplicable only because <laughs> the bad news is so overwhelming sometimes, but nonetheless, my, I, I think, you know, it doesn't take very many good examples of seeing inspiring kids, inspiring schools, inspiring anecdotes of all kinds to say, hey, we can do better. We really can do better. And if we can get more kids across the whole spectrum, but especially looking at the uh, more difficult parts of the spectrum, on track to grow, to thrive, to look to bright futures, there's more hope than sometimes uh, uh, many people think. So that is my hope, is that this will pay off. And my hope would be that any and all of us, in I don't even know what ways, sometimes just by being aware citizens, can be part of advocating for, for these kind of positive steps.